Um, and I cannot tell you how thrilling it is to see so many of you in the room tonight um, for Sarah Ahmed's book. I just come from Portobello, where it was a transphobic event. There were a tiny little flurry of people going in and dozens and dozens, I would say, of them. <laughs> And even with that, two people are all here. So um, intersectional feminism for the win on this Tuesday. And I'm going to hand over to the brilliant Dr. Katrina Bento, who's going to be your host with us for the night. And, and, and will you all join me in giving them a very warm welcome, Sarah Ahmed and Katrina Bento. Night. This is one of the moments that I say, hi, mom. <laughs> I'm here. We said, um, <laughs> thank you for this invitation. Um, it is uh, very meaningful for me to be here uh, in this conversation with Sarah, which will allow me to with Sarah. Um, Sarah, for me, uh, is a writer on affect, of affect, through affect. She's the inspiration for my uh -huh moment when I was writing my PhD uh, dissertation and both of my supervisors had closed a uh, relationship with that are somehow Shirley and Tate and Shona Hunter, especially Shirley, who I will always be thankful for everything that she taught me, including how to cite Sarah in my work. Um, Sarah became an inspiration not only because she allowed me to see through different, different lenses uh, the aspects that circulate in feminist, feminist circles. You know, the, the research center, the network, the grassroots, how affects circulating, sometimes reenacting harm, sometimes showing us that there are other possibilities to be in this world with more affects and radical love. Thank you, Sarah. It, it helped me to also regulate my own professionality as a feminist and try to understand the world um, from a more caring and gentle way and how I am responsible for the gentleness or the careful spaces that I hold for my students, that I hold for my colleagues, my friends, my sisters, and so on. So thank you, Sada, for that. Um, that is also the woman who liberated herself from the shackles of academic <laughs> oh my god, my full of gratitude for it and that might not be so easy to do and has its cost, but still we're here. And well, uh, most of us, and I hope all of us will not disappear, whether it is through our existence or our absence in some spaces because that's all the ways to make our presence very important. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the book. I want to introduce this conversation. We use my translator skills in using language as a way to make an inquiry and querying the field of knowledge 
the space of not knowing, an intentional occupation in playfulness and systemic disobedience with the grammar, grammar of violence, and not a very serious take on classic convention. As a feminist curious story myself, I often observe my pleasure in pulling the threads of narratives of the alphabet to renegotiate and recreate others, words, meanings, and so on. And I love the translation process that enables me to be in this creative space of the colonial occupation, dealing with the contradiction that these two words together can manifest, the colonial occupation, and put them in different directions. So occupying language in Portuguese from Brazil, or Brazilian Portuguese, this colonial language that entangles Afro-Indigenous Afro and Indigenous possibilities for new meanings, a cute joy could mean a estrada prazeres. That is, someone who ruins the pleasure, someone who screws up enjoyment, the person who spoils delight. I have been thinking about the act of screw up pleasure. It is a queer invitation to the purpose of how whiteness has been gazing at other bodies with curiosity or intending to put the cop to put on the cover of the equality and inclusion report, making them feel better and not changing institutional protocols, tools, and practices that reference respond. So I thought I suggest the book saying no saying no becomes a problem and the path to others to say no. So we open uh, means we open the, the possibilities to continue saying no to that kind of practice. Then the comfortable joy of not having to deal with the problem, the pleasure of having simple conversations and sadistic jokes become complicated, problematic, not pleasurable, difficult. The queer invitation to his crew of pleasure, the lovely contradiction that the fascinating power of language allows us, me in particular in this moment, think of it, the crew of pleasure, is disrupting the heterosis patriarchal norms in form and effect. To screw up the pleasure of patriarchy speaks to the one of the cute joy maxim that Ahmed brings to the book, become monstrous. And it is, and I quote, to make the family strange, creating different kinds of families, combinations, blends, we lose in the hold of the family, the norm, the form. We spill out of it. We spill all over the place. It's spilling words in a careful way. The spillage, I quote again, can be breaking of a container, a narrative, a turning of phases. The spillage can be then the slow labor of getting out of something, a poem too, that can be what spills. Ahmed invites Alex Polinzo in the creative process that casts queerness as a possibility. What becomes possible when we are immersed in the queerness of forms of life that dominant systems cannot chart, reward, or even understand? So, from the early years of PhD, when I had been uh, inspired by Sarah Ahmed's work on affect, on emotion, on being feminist, Q joy, it is my pleasure to be in conversation with you Sarah today. I have been reflective on the past month as I read and I, I listen to the audiobook uh, complaint and this kind of book. Actually, um, I don't know if you need or if you listen or if you use audiobooks. I do as a dyslexic ADHD person, and it's very helpful. It's Sarah who is reading this handbook. So it is um, kind of conveying many of the nuances of her just on being a feminist to joy 
and it was a pleasure actually to listen to your voice reading the book. Um, and I read Complaint and this handbook about querying possibilities to navigate the effects and the aspect of being and always becoming a feminist Kim Jong. I bring this Brazilian Portuguese translation into this introduction as a feminista strada prazer, the ruler of pleasures, as a way to maybe start conversation about vocabulary and the maxims and the truth and the commitment that it brings the, to the book, into the book and into our reflexive practices. And I, re I reiterate for the racist, LGBTQ phobic, transphobic, patriarchal, patriotic, this norm, I am a feminist Kiwi Joy. Thank you, Sarah, for this interaction with this practice. And for that, I am willing to cause an happiness. This is me just reproducing the, the commitment that you are going to find in the book. I am willing to get in the way of feminist happiness. If being a feminist Kiwi Joy is a phase, I am willing to remain in that phase. I am not willing to get over what is not over. When critique causes cause damage, I am willing to cause damage. I am willing, willing to be inconvenient. I am already the black angry woman anyways, so be it. I am not willing to make happen in my cause. I am willing to snap a bond that is damaging to others. I am willing to be inconvenient. I am willing to take feminist Q choice with me wherever I go. So thank you, Sada, for taking me sometimes in this in this journey, even if you are so apart with your your publications, the way you share uh, your words, even on your tweets. It's always a pleasure to read and to be in this journey of being a feminist Q choice. Thank you. Mary, the Lighthouse, and all of you for being here with us today. It's such a cool joy, joy to have so many of you um, through all the lights. It's wonderful. So I'm really pleased to be launching the Feminist Kill Joy Handbook today. And I'm going to talk to you about the handbook for about uh, 25 minutes or so, and then we're going to have a conversation. And I want to share with you some reflections on why I think of Killing Joy as a world-making project. This was, in fact, the tagline on my blog, which I began back in 2013, so just, just, just under 10 years ago now. So I've been writing about Feminist Killjoys for some time. I've been a Feminist Killjoy for much longer. But the handbook is the first time I've given them a book of their own. So why is their book a handbook uh, for you? I, I think of a handbook as a hand, a helping hand, an outstretched hand, perhaps also a handle, how you hold on to something. It is my hope that the handbook will be a helping hand for those of us who are fighting against injustices of many kinds. We need helping hands and also handbooks, because the costs of that fight are made so high. So being a feminist killjoy can at times be messy and confusing. It can keep you close to what is painful, but it can also give us moments of clarity and illumination. So in that handbook, I offer some killjoy truths You've already heard about these. I also call these hard-worn wisdoms, the things we know because of what keeps coming up. Killjoy equations, what's quirky and revealing about our knowledge, commitments as well as maxims. I also offer some killjoy survival tips. There they are. Um, and yes, my first tip to surviving as a feminist killjoy is to become one. 
So a history too can be a handle. It can help to know that where we are, others have been. So to become a feminist killjoy can be to hear yourself in history. So one student wrote to me, I am a feminist killjoy and I didn't know these two words described everything I've ever been all my life. Feminist killjoy can be another way of describing yourself, even being yourself. And there can be creativity in that description. But when you name yourself as a feminist killjoy, you are relating yourself to others, hearing in a term that comes from elsewhere, something of yourself. So even when we become her, the feminist killjoy remains exterior to us. This is why I sometimes describe myself as a feminist killjoy and at other times describe her as my companion. So I wrote the book with the feminist killjoy as my companion, and I hope it offers you companionship. And we can sometimes keep each other company by sharing our killjoy story. And the handbook is in a way a collection of those killjoy stories. Some of these stories uh, begin in our table. The handbook itself begins with a story around a family table, but other tables appear. There are lots of tables. Meeting tables and conference tables. So I'm going to take you to a meeting table. I'm going to take you back to the academic year 1994-1995. It's my first year as a lecturer in women's studies at Lancaster. I'm in the top room of the fanciest building on campus. We are seated around a large rectangular table. The meeting is called the approval of new courses and I'm there because I have a new course on gender, race and colonialism being considered. Most of these courses are approved without much discussion. But when my course comes up, a professor from another department begins to interrogate me, becoming angrier and angrier as he went on. And he went on. I was there seated at the same table as he, a young woman, a person of colour, in fact, the only brown person in the room. No one else said anything. The word in the course description that triggered his reaction was the relatively uneventful word implicated. <laughs> that I had used that word was a sign, he said, that I thought colonialism was a bad thing. <laughs> he then gave me a lecture on how colonialism was a good thing. Colonialism as modernity, that happy story of railways, language and law that is so familiar because we've heard it before. I think of this as a killjoy encounter, not because I spoke time in response to what he said when he said it, I didn't, but because I could hear from his reaction that what I was doing was speaking back, refusing to tell that story, that happy story of imperial progression, a polished story. To polish can mean to make something smooth and shiny by friction or coating, to see to one's appearance and also to refine or improve. We might be asked, nay, required to gloss over the violence of imperial history, the violence of the history that led some of us to be here, empire as world polishing, a happy picture of empire created by the removal of violence and the removal of evidence of that removal. So we can become killjoys when we refuse to polish the picture or to be the polish in the picture when we don't smile for their brochures, for instance, I call diversity institutional polishing. That shiny picture of the institution that works by removing so much from the picture. And to be a pure joy is framed very quickly, not only as stealing happiness, but stealing history. One article by conservative politician begins by stating, Britain is under attack not in a physical sense, but in a philosophical, ideological and historical sense. Our heritage is under a direct assault. The very sense of what it is to be British has been called into question. 
institutions have been undermined, the reputation of key figures in our country's history have been traduced. Movements such as Black Lives Matter and decolonizing the curriculum, he suggests, are not motivated by positivity. <laughs> Quite the reverse. So positivity is tied to preservation. And negativity then is more than a story of motivation. By locating negativity in the outsider, whether the killjoy or as this author does, the woke, culture and history are stabilized treated as if they are a positive quality. The author also says, words that have been universally understood for millennia, such as man and woman, are now emotionally charged and dangerous. Of course, this statement is not true. Language changes, words change, including yes, man and woman, just as we do. Even to question the meaning of words such as man or woman, trying to open them up, is treated as giving them a negative charge or even as stopping people from using them. Indeed, another conservative politician, he's since become prime minister, said, <laughs> we want to confront this left-handed culture that seems to want to cancel our history, our values, our women. <laughs> the argument that women are being canceled expressed with that old sex of possessive, our women, seems to be drawing loosely from the gender political argument that the term gender has replaced sex. The handbook itself thus far has been reviewed once in a mainstream newspaper by a gender critical feminist. I'm just sharing how the time represented that view. Uh, a feminist book by an author who's forgotten what a woman is. Oops. <laughs> that one. <laughs> so perhaps then you're supposed to treat sex like a statue, what you have to affirm as being there. All it takes to be heard as destructive and dangerous or as forgetful is not to affirm something, its existence, its nature, its value. There is so much you must refuse to affirm. And if you don't affirm something, you're treated as cancelling it. And so when students ask for more philosophies from outside the West to be taught, they're represented as falling to the cancelling of white philosophers, as feeling who or what is there. So you know, that negativity might at first belong to the judgment, not the action, that what you're doing is damaging. Killing Joy becomes a world-making project when we refuse to be redirected by that judgment away from the action. Instead, we turn the judgment into a project. So we keep it up, keep questioning, trying to widen the range of meanings, the range of texts being taught, trying to open up terms, to find our own terms for who we are or how we are, even when what we are doing or so being is deemed damaging. We make a commitment that I call the core killed your commitment that you mentioned with me as well. I'm willing to pause, I'm happy now. So, if refusing to tell the happy story of imperial progression causes unhappiness, that's what I'm willing to pause. If critiquing the sex binary is forgetting ourselves, we are willing to be forgetful. If talking about institutional problems causes a problem, then we're willing to become the problem. Kill joy truth. When you expose a problem, you pose a problem. One way of dealing with a problem is to stop people from talking about it or to make the people who talk about it go away. If people stop talking about a problem or the people who talk about it go away, it can then be assumed the problem has gone away too. To become a feminist killjoy is to refuse to concede by letting the problem proceed. And a problem is not just about what is being said, it is what is being done. It is about who is being given room and who is not. The feminist killjoy seems to become up, as well as her killjoy kin, other kinds of killjoy, whenever we ask for something to change. You can kill joy by asking to be addressed by the right pronouns or by correcting people if they use the wrong one. You can kill joy by saying your partner is she, not he. You can kill joy by asking for that panel or that binary not to be all white men again. 
you can kill Joy by asking to change the room because the room they had booked is not acceptable again. Kill Joy True. We had to keep saying it because they keep doing it. But even if we are saying it because of what they keep doing, we are good as the ones repeating ourselves, a broken record, stuck on the same point. And once you notice someone who says it, you don't even have to say it. You just have to open your mouth in a meeting and eyes will start rolling as if to say, oh, here she goes. I call that a killjoy equation. Rolling eye equals balance pedagogy. So the negativity of that judgment speaks to us. To reclaim the figure of the feminist killjoy becomes a queer project because we do not try and separate ourselves from the negation, we stick with it. We turn their no out. We direct it back at the world that has said no to us. I think back to how the professor heard a no in my use of the word independent. We can make the no the implication of our work. We firm the no up, we share it, and we say it louder. A no might begin as a feeling. My final killjoy survival tip is to feel everything, including killjoy joy. Becoming a feminist culture often begins with feeling. We do not feel what I feel, or we do not feel what we're supposed to feel. We're not made happy by the right things, or we're made happy by the wrong one. You might become what I call affect values, killjoy equation. <coughs> killjoy equation, affect alien equals alienated by how you are affected. And so we turn feelings into a resource. And to turn feelings into resource is to turn not inwards, but outwards towards things. When we experience a visceral reaction, a no, a questioning, an indignation, or a refusal, to become a feminist killjoy critic is to explain that reaction. So consider a scene from Tony Morrison's The Bluest Eye. It had begun with Christmas and the gift of dolls. The big, the special, the loving gift was always a big blue-eyed baby doll. From the clucking sound of apples, I knew that the doll represented what they thought was my fondest wish, what was supposed to bring me great pleasure, succeeded in doing quite the opposite. I traced the turned up nose, poked the glassy blue eyes, twisted the yellow hair. I could not love it, but I could examine it to see what it was that all the world said was lovable. Claudia knows from the adults talking that she's supposed to love the white baby doll, but she's not affected the right way the white way, she's even affected in the opposite way. And not loving the doll means that Claudia can examine that to learn what the world said was love doll. We learn about love from what we don't love, about happiness and what is supposed to make us happy, but doesn't. So a doll can be a window into a world. We see something more clearly when we are not seeing ourselves. Killjoy truth. The less you see yourself in a reflection, the more you see in a reflection. Think again of diversity, that shiny reflection. We see through it, but it can still be labor. And the handbook is about that labor. It can still be hard. We have to hammer away, not just at the world, but sometimes our own trust. A word can be a hammer. Audrey Lord in her essay, Eye to Eye, describes racism and sexism as grown-up words. We experience them before we can name what we experience. To return to your past with those words is to see something that you did not see at the time when it was happening. Lord describes how she was in a car listening to a radio when she heard about the acquittal of a white police officer who had killed a black child. This was back in 1978. Racism, the same things keep happening. Lord tells us that she had to stop the car because she was so sick and with fury. She had to stop the car to get a poem out. She teaches us that we have to take it in, the violence in, white supremacy, police brutality to express ourselves, to get a known out. She teaches us that we need to let the violence travel through us. The poem she wrote was called Power, and the poem suggests we need not to let our power lie limp and useless as an unconnected wire. 
to get the violence out. Lord uses words like electricity, snap, snap, sizzle. She makes a connection to others. She keeps that connection alive. So that known, that small word, can be what travels. I hear now a poem by the Sikh feminist poet Jasmine Huwa called Scream. Scream so that one day, a hundred years from now, another sister will not have to dry her tears wondering where in history she lost her voice. I hear the first line of this poem, a word can be a line, is demand a plea, loving and urgent to scream so that others can hear us. I say loving as well as the urgent as the poem teaches us the point of becoming louder. That scream, piercing the atmosphere is so, so that she, another sister who comes after, will not be left wondering how or so where she lost her voice in history. We need you to know that we said no. We need that no for tears to flow. No, a small word can be a word with a lot of work to do. And in the handbook, I, I'm, I'm trying to unravel what it takes to say no, who it takes. Sometimes a no can be what you have to reach. I talked to a student who took a long time to say no to a professor who had been harassing and bullying her. She comes to realise eventually that her first impression that something was wrong was right, she said. And then I was like, no, 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 things are wrong, not just turn to gender, things are desperately wrong with the way he's teaching full stop. I think of all those no's, no, 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 the sound of an increasing confidence in her own judgment, an army of no's, a feminist army, kill Joy Maxim, get a no out so that others can follow. And she told me that she said no because of other students, she said no because she wanted to prevent other students from having to go through such practice. She understood that unless she said no, he would continue to act in the same way. No as non-reproductive labour. So what happens? She tells the convener of the MA program she's attending to complain and she receives a warning. Be careful, he's an important man. A warning is a judgment about who is important, as well as a direction. She doesn't take heed of the warning and makes a complaint. And in her terms, she sacrificed the references. And in reference to the prospect of doing a PhD, she said, that door is closed. That door is closed. References can be doors, how some have stopped from progressing. In other words, the one who said no has nowhere to go. The people that hold the door to institutions are the same people that close the door on those who are trying to stop them abusing their power. It takes a political movement to open these doors. Let me share with you briefly some of what I learned from being involved in such a movement. I began working to support students who submitted a collective complaint about sexual harassment in 2013. After three years, we could not even get a public acknowledgement that there had been inquiries, let alone why they had taken place. It was like they hadn't happened, which is, I'd rather imagine, the effect they were looking for. So I resigned. And when I resigned, I um, realised, of course, that there was no point in resigning in silence when I was resigning to protest silence. So I shared information on my blog and I became a feminist killjoy all over again. The university quickly launched a public relations campaign, treating the disclosure as the same that needed to be wiped away. I expected that reaction. What was unexpected was the reaction from my feminist colleagues. One said that my action was against the interests of many long-standing feminist colleagues who worked to ensure a happy and stimulating environment. So we need to learn here from the fact that it's possible that a disclosure about sexual harassment could be framed as compromising, not just the happiness of the institution, but feminist happiness. When some feminists are resourced by institutions, they seem to end up loyal to them. So we might need to snap a bond to an institution to prevent other people from being damaged by them, as Audrey Law teach, teaches us. We might need to make a commitment because when we try to question the master house, we are treated as the ones who are threatening. 
This is why Kevin's Killjoy is so much to teach everyone. We are learning the reproductive mechanisms. Those that have power institutions are those who are likely to reproduce them. If you say yes, you are more likely to progress. I spoke to a woman of colour who experienced bullying and harassment in her department. She told me how she was not supported by a senior white feminist professor who was head of another department. She said, it's easy to be radical on paper, but in reality, it's quite different. Her politics were to do with advancing her career and nothing to do with changing the landscape for women. So maybe the door is open to some of us on condition we shut that door behind us. Shutting the door can be about stopping other people from getting in or not supporting them so that they can get in, but it can also mean shutting the door so that the violence can't be seen. And perhaps that's why the feminist killjoy is so threatening. She's holding up another kind of mirror, reflecting back what has been denied, containing not just our own, but other people's truths. Radical on paper. Killjoy activists know all about paper feminists. But if we can be feminists on paper, we can also be paper feminist killjoys. Feminist killjoys in public, loudly complaining what we are against, but not behind closed doors when we are called upon to give our support to someone making a complaint about harassment, for instance. So it's too easy to adopt the killjoy, to claim her, to have her on a t-shirt, to write through her or even add her without changing what else that we do. And I'm saying this to myself. This is a note to self, given that I have a t-shirt. A lot of them. There is more to being a feminist killjoy than saying you are one. The risk of using the feminist killjoy more, once the risk I accept in my own work, is that she does less, becoming easier to adopt. Another woman of colour academic wrote to me, there's another man on my campus who's been a subject of complaint from women who has a feminist killjoy sign on his door. <laughs> when one of the women he had harmed told him that seeing the sign on his door after everything he had done made her uncomfortable, he filed his ability to complain against her to the chair. I don't know how any of this is possible. But we do need to know that it's possible. If we say you were doing this, appropriating the feminist killjoy for your own end, he might look over his shoulder, assuming you're talking about somebody else. If he does see himself, defend himself so that we become uncivil, the problem, the pointing out the problem, all over again. We need to say no to that and perhaps channeling the energy of feminists of colour and black feminists, such as Mona, Elta Howie, and Stella Nianzi, with their willingness to swear and their radical rudeness, shout loudly. Take the feminist killjoy sign off your fucking door. But it's hard because those who hold the door have the feminist killjoy sign on it. And what do you do then? Remember and know it can be a door, how you are stopped from entering. If becoming a killjoy can stop people progressing, part of that task, I think, is to find ways to stop people from being stopped. We need to share the cost of killing joy trying to protect those who are more precarious from paying too much. Some people can't afford to say no. Some people can't afford not to say no. So if that's the case, you have to find ways to get their no out. I know that earlier that when I shared my reasons for resigning in public, my action was treated by the institution and some of my former colleagues, family colleagues as damaging, but that wasn't the most important consequence. I began to receive messages from many different people telling me what happened when they complained. I heard from other people who'd left their posts and professions as a result of a complaint. So one story coming out can lead to more stories coming out. And many of these are the stories that I share in the handbook. Kildred equation, a leak equals a feminist leak. So becoming leaks, we become easier to find. People who come to us with their story. The work we do is to get a no out of ourselves, yes, but also to get the no out of the institution so that it can be reached by somebody else. I think of a conversation I had with an Indigenous student. She had made an informal complaint about white supremacy in her classroom, using that term for what's that the university can get you in serious trouble. She knew that, but she was still doing that. 
and she was willing to do it. And she became in her terms a monster and had to complete her PhD off campus. But she said that an unexpected little gift was that other students know you are out there and can reach out to you. She used that expression twice, an unexpected little gift. In saying no, you also keep a history alive. You do not let go. You even pass that note on so that others can hold on. You get your note out is to get them to who might need them. I think also the favorite student I spoke to, she told me how she had to appear wrongly grateful to get reasonable accommodations, but she didn't get reasonable accommodations. So she had to make a complaint. She wasn't getting anywhere. And she had a particularly difficult meeting, meeting could be when you feel the wall coming down. And then suddenly a load of documents turned up on the student union's fax machine. And we don't know where they came from. They were historical documents about students who had to leave. These documents included a handwritten letter to a human rights charity by a former student who had cancer and was trying to get the university to let her complete her degree part time. So if this student I spoke to hadn't made a complaint, that letter and that file would have stayed put, dusty and buried. So in saying no, you can release past no's. A momentum can be what is behind you. She talked about how she thought a secretary had released those files and that was her only bit of direct action. So there's all these different actors can be involved in getting the no out. So a momentum can be what gets behind, what, what can be how we get behind each other. This student's own activism gathered momentum and she began working with a group of disabled activists to use compliance with the law as a method of putting organisations under pressure to be as accessible as they claimed to be. And then she took her works onto the streets, writing to letters, uh, writing letters to owners of shops that were not accessible to her as a wheelchair user. So from her, I learned how we can take Demis Kildrews out onto the streets and political histories of demonstrating our histories of those willing to put our bodies in the way, to turn our bodies into blockage points that stop the flow of human traffic, as well as the wider flow of an economy. We stop the cars. I think of Audrey Lord stopping the car to write a poem about power, how she took the violence of the police in the violence of white supremacy to get it out. We put everything into an action by getting as many as we can behind it. And right now we need to be that many because of how many of us are under attack. Our claims to personal dismissed as identity politics, our critiques as cancel culture, our lives treated not only as light and whimsical as lifestyles, but as endangering others or recruiting them. These attacks, which are relentless, are designed to crush spirits and they are directed especially to trans people right now. And can I express my full joy solidarity to you today and every day? It can be exhausting having to fight for existence, kill joy truth. When you have to fight for existence, fighting can become an existence. And so we need each other. We need to become each other's resource. Feminism can or should be such a resource, but what goes under the name of feminism, at least in the UK right now, is anti-queer as well as anti-trans, willing to use categories such as sex or nature or nail to exclude some of us, categories that many of us have long critiqued. We say no to this, and we need more to say no to this. Gildroy Truth. The more we come against, the more we need more. The more we need more. This is the last truth in the handbook. For Killjoys, it is not the more the merrier, it is the more the heavier. We give each other weight. That no too becomes heavier or louder when we say it together. We keep writing, we keep fighting, knowing that we are sending our work out into the very hostile environment that we critique. We say no, even when we know it is hard to get through. We say no together for each other to make room so that we can be here. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for this amazing presentation. And also, uh, I really appreciate the, the image that you bring to your presentation in general, which shows the pedagogical approach to the feminist ways of uh, narrating and explaining uh, some of the very important ways you are thinking, right? And um, well, I know that on the book you talk about um, some of the journeys that brought you to this point of being a feminist killjoy and who you writing for, the, who you writing this book for, the feminist killjoys up there. Um, but what does it take to put together all these narratives of uh, killjoys when we, and just to go back to the idea of affect, right, and how that affect has an effect on us uh, in terms of the pain that we feel by revisiting those experiences or sometimes even <clears throat> to listen to, to narratives of those who are more maybe vulnerable positions to say no or to experience harm. How was this process for you? Very good question. And I, I might respond to everything you just said, if that's all right. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about the visual images. That's not a visual image, but I did show images of tables that were polished. <laughs> you know, the first time I actually showed a visual image to correspond with one of the concepts or ideas that I was sharing, was when I did the book on being included, which was about diversity work. And I um, I was writing about walls and was like, I need, I need a photo. So I went out and took a photo of a brick wall. And that moment changed so much because I began to use the image to show. And then there's something about, I used to have a, a, a line, a job description, and then I would show a photograph of a wall. A job description is a wall description. And then just visually seeing that wall in front of you, that brick wall that stops, that, 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 that you know is so hard that you're going to talk against it, actually allowed you to really capture the effective quality, the quality of what diversity officers were telling me, that it's a banging your head against a brick wall job. Like the wall became a hand to convey something about the nature of the work. So I think it's actually been quite important. And then it just went, went on from there. So. Um, I think when we're thinking about sharing the work about doing the hard work, letting the pain in, trying to transform histories that have become heavy and hard, we have to think about how we can do that, how we can make the effects of that part of the, the vocabulary that we use, but also what we're bringing to the room. Um, so it's sort of interesting that the visual images brought me to effect in a way that is that the question that you're asking, pulling together all these stories. I mean, um, one of the reasons I wrote the handbook was you mentioned that I left university, um, it, you know, the university system, and it, it can sound like a, um, a liberation story, you know, maybe it is, but I also feel like I left quite a lot behind. And one of the things that I really remember, um, very, uh, I, I can just feel, Feel when I even just think about it, is, is the experience of being a feminist teacher in the classroom and watching watching the, the impact feminist ideas and concepts can have on people when they first encounter them. Like you have words, you have language, names, things that you might have felt but couldn't ever put into words. It, it can be quite, um, well, you had that Expression yourself, but was the little sound you made? Aha, uh -huh, yeah, aha. Uh -huh. Or I think it's a click, click, like, and um, but I'm no longer in the classroom. So, in a way, when I was thinking about writing the handbook, I was thinking about that process of being transformed by an engagement with feminist ears, but not assuming the classroom is where the work was going. 
So I was thinking of bringing together these stories as you described, many of them are difficult, uh, painful stories, and there are traumatic stories within the handbook. But in some ways, I suppose for me, the process of bringing them together into, into one text is, 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 is a process of like collectivity and gathering that is about companionship. So even when I was doing the research that led to the book Complaint, which I did just after I left my job and my whole life changed. And it's going to be spelling me, how am I doing that? You know, should you be a much playing your dog? And of course, I am playing my dog too, right? But it was actually really, really helpful that to listen to other people's stories helped me come to terms with my own. And for me, this process of bringing together killjoys in one book, you know, they're, they're naughty, you know, they're, they're, they're up to a lot, they're doing things. And so although there is pain and there's trauma, there's also a kind of sense of vitality. Because one of the things I've always known about talking about school joy is that however hard the situation might be, it might be that you become estranged from your friend or your family member because you called out something they said that you can't bear not calling out. However, the much that is that when you talk about the killjoy, there seems to be some sort of energy and electricity in that. The figure seems to carry something possibility and agency either. So for me, the process of pinging together the narrative actually felt um it didn't it didn't it felt it felt like quite a creative and and, and a sort of I had a sense of being energized by by the process of bringing them together. Just to your question. Thank you. Uh, I think I wanted to touch on the point that uh, that you mentioned about the risk of being a killjoy and not everyone will be able to say no or to be able to um, to refuse a particular situation or practices because of their positionality or because of the circumstances. Um, so I just wanted to ask you if you could say a little bit more about uh, the risk, especially when we are building solidarity uh, among other feminist killjoys. Because there is no, and by no means, well, I mean, I meant to romanticize your exit of academia, uh, because there is another layer of how you build solidarity from it, and how you are also isolated in, a, in, in some ways when you are practicing uh, killjoy. So I just wanted to ask if you could say a little bit more about that. A really, really good question that I just when I was at Elden Leeds yesterday and um, I mentioned somebody asked me about failure <laughs> and guilt, which is not I don't I've never had a good relationship to guilt. <laughs> and um, I was reflecting on it. And, and anyway, I, I mentioned that I didn't feel a sense of failure from leaving my job, but I was really aware that at one level I was kind of leaving students behind. And I thought that I, I was no longer going to be in proximity to those students at that institution. And I was aware that they might have needed me. Um, and a student came up to me after and said, Sarah, oh, you're, you're in proximity to us. You actually are in proximity. You're, you're more in proximity now. So I think there's a lot of different ways in which we can combine our forces. And sometimes that's about being, sometimes it's an emergency. You, you assemble a group in an institution because shit is happening that is going to make it impossible for some people to be there. And by combining your forces and working together, you can get enough pressure on the institution to get something to be done. Because so often the fact that you are vulnerable to being harassed is also what makes it hard to get your no heard. And that's when collectivity really matters. And the idea of complaint collectives comes from that. But sometimes it's where you... You, you don't you don't actually you're in the same time and place but still there's a way of thinking about the solidarity that can be achieved over time like some of the stories i just ended with were about in a way not not being in the same time and place actually you find out about previous students who might have been trying to protest the same structures that you are because you protested those structures or students who are to come people who are to come you've left a trace behind by saying no even if you didn't get through they know that you said no, they found a file, a trade, something on the wall even, graffiti on the door even. And I think there's, when I've been thinking about writing, I was thinking a lot about that. 
like the kind of collectivity that's possible through time. So you don't always meet in person, but the but the actions they don't disappear, even if you don't feel that you've got through that you did something, meant something. And there's, I think, a lot of emphasis in the handbook on creativity and its relationship to the collective. That actually, because these histories can be so hard and can give us such a little room to maneuver, because the very people that are receiving our complaints are people with planning power, you often have to be very inventive to get anywhere. Um, and I certainly describe that in the chapter on activism, but there's also in the chapter on poetry, I was thinking a little bit about. Um, one example is for Half Lake's Pansy Project. Um, some of you might know the queer artists planted pansies everywhere for the common families where the grass to take place. You know, pansies are flowers, where pansy is fur. So you can plant something that 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 is a trace of that history. So when I that's when I think about the, the need to be collective and the need to work together and to keep societal therefore creative actions that have little effects beyond the be on the present and provide forms of support and solidarity that you can like the one student said to me and I will stop off this quote she was, she was writing to me about her experience in plan she's in a difficult place and she gave me a trigger warning actually for the content of her letter and at the end she said um I am you are I, I'm your kill to a shoulder and together we are proud I can't see it now, but I know it's there. It's just a very beautiful idea, that idea of being killed to the shoulders when you lean on each other, but also how you come to the sense that, 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 that people are out there, you can't always see them, but you know they're there. This is very beautiful, especially, uh, and I'm going to be very selfish here, uh, my work on uh, Black feminism and, and, and critical race <laughs> Evokes a lot of ancestrality and how we are connected somehow with ancestral knowledge that of, of bodies that somehow have been erased. I'm sorry, my voice is terrible today. <clears throat> of bodies and knowledges that have been erased intentionally by the same or a similar harmful system that we are fighting today. So I, it's beautiful to see how you also talk about this shoulders that I can't often see, uh, whether they are in here, uh, leaving, uh, or they have passed for a different circumstances um, and in different times and in different places as you end the book. Um, and for that, I, I wanted to just say or ask a little bit more about the, this creative space of solidarity, especially using poems or creative writing. Uh, because in writing and language, we can also create other spaces that are maybe unexpected. Uh, yeah. And in this, it can be grassroots movements, it can be a different form of uh, building a classroom that are not necessarily the physical form or not necessarily as institutional as expected. Um, so yeah, these are the creative aspects that when you write about poems, disrupting a norm, a normative way of erasing and harm, uh, I felt really inspired also how it enacts other forms of power and the power, you know, the good power, <laughs> the kill joy power. Yeah. Well, I, I do think I'm, I'm very um, taken by Audre Lorde's image in power of power, uh, not letting it die and useless as an unconnected wife. And the emphasis she sort of plays, places on expression as connections. So I'm, I've always loved, loved the word expression, and I'm, I'm interested in the press part of expression, the, the you have to press something out of yourself. Sometimes it, it, you have to really push hard to get something out of yourself. And, um, I think what I'm left with Lord is that expression, which we might think of as self-expression, is actually better thought of as a connection to others. So you're getting it, um, the out is the to, you're getting it to someone. So a poem is addressed to someone, um, and you don't know where it's going to go. And she, she said uh, in one interview that 
she thinks of herself um, as a creator of poems, but also like she has uh, the artifact of her life. I think she uses these terms to describe herself. Like it's about survival, like keeping alive, keeping something of yourself alive, giving yourself somewhere to go. So then a poem becomes another form of like self-making. Um, she also describes motherhood actually alongside me, uh, giving birth to, to new life, giving birth to possibility, despite everything, despite how much the system is designed to destroy you. Um, and there's a way in which then that creativity becomes a, a, a resistance to the demand that you seek. And I'm very also saying I have a that kind of killjoy genealogy in my own family. My auntie uh, is one of the people I dedicate the hand to. It's called Barbano. She was a poet and she was also a killjoy. She, <laughs> she was very opinionated. I think they used to say I'm not like her. I think it was from those rounds. Um, and I think there's a way in which, as well, when you think about like what histories and inheritance that for me, creativity is also about that. It's not just about making something that wasn't there, which is creativity you wanted to the future. It's also what can you pull upon? Who do you pull upon? Who, who the paths and the pathways that make it possible for you to have um, the opportunity to say something or to be something. So yeah, the, that chapter on the poet was the one I like writing the most. I'm not myself a poet, but in the process of writing in the last, I don't know, probably since queer phonology, which was out in 2006, I have become more interested, I feel like my own language has, has quite, not, not poeticness as such, but it's much more about sound and rhythm. And I think that's partly because it's a way of like breathing, in the language. Because I think, you know, we probably both of us are writing about really hard histories. So you're staying close to what um, historically and personally causes so much harm um, that, that, that you have to find a way to be able to handle the material, which goes back to the question. And I, I think I think there's something about Lord's work and the importance of it to me is partly because from her I learned that. The, the vitality and the energy, the very words that we use to hammer away at the past to actually break down what is difficult are the words that give us a sense of possibility for who we can be and how we can find other people. Because the thing about the school joy is, yeah, it can cut you off, but it can it can also be like how you write a poem, but it can also be how you find your people. People get it, they get you. And there's creativity and art in that process. I really enjoyed reading that chapter in particular. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, should we open for the audience to ask questions, please come in? One at the back. And then while you're all thinking, I'll one online, then we'll go to you. And we can you to, yeah, or if there is one, you want to do um, so this one is from Catherine on the website. She says, um, I'd like to ask Sarah, how do you approach a situation where the gatekeepers are claiming to be holding the door open for others by the virtue of their having passed through, whereas in fact, often the moon of them, their presence is pushed against the door opening first. Thank you for your help. Yes, I mean, I can just say, uh, I'll break it up. I need to repeat the question. Do I need to repeat the question? Yeah. So, what what do you do with the people that are holding the door open for you? Are actually the ones barring your entry by virtue of how they enter? In a way, um, that that's a problem that I totally recognise. Um, I, I I called it shutting the door, or or in my book, complaint versus the door deal, because I think there's a way when I. What, there's a way in what I'm trying to describe to, in the chapter on activism is how power incentivizes certain kind of actions. So you will have the door open for you as long as you agree to uphold the master's rule. Um, and that invitation to identify with the master doesn't even necessarily have to operate as an explicit instruction. It's more a kind of like 
set of opportunities and possibilities that seem to be open the more you abide or, or, or say yes and to enable um, the right people to progress, the more you cite the right people, the more you reference people who already got value and importance of the institution. So you uh, progress by saying yes. And, and then your progression, maybe your person of colour, becomes evidence that the door is open. But then in order to keep your position in the institution, you precisely disidentify from uh, the position even of being a person of colour, uh, disappear into the institution. And then your very progression is used as evidence that there is no door, there is nothing stopping somebody else from entering, which is what stops them from entering. So that, that's the problem. Um, and we know it's very familiar, it's not just something to do with universities, but actually how power operates. And you can see that as government right now more than, than, more than ever. Um, I don't have a solution <laughs> um, other than finding ways to recognize it and to diagnose it structurally rather than through any sort of kind of analysis of personality. Um, we need to have structural analyses of that problem. And, and that's also partly critiquing the use of positive diversity in discourse. Um, I have about 50 questions, but I'm going to stick to one. Um, I'm quite evangelical by complaint, um, but there's a, a level of it that um, I was wondering if you could speak to. I work in political equalities, and so I have this kind of archive of stories that people have told me about terrible things that have happened to them, but that they're not willing to complain about. Um, and it's not because of, we talk a lot about loyalty to institutions, but for them, it's more loyalty to the cause. And this happens in political parties and in NGOs and all kinds of stuff. There's people not wanting to bring bad press upon the cause and that they, they're only willing to do it at the point at which they'll burn everything to the ground. And there's a, there has to be something that we can do before that stage. Is there any advice that you can give me on how to find that page before they're willing to just take everything away? I mean, I'm happy, just, just to be clear, I'm happy for them to burn it to the ground. <laughs> it's just that they're so scared of losing all of their friends and all of these people that they've worked with. And... Yeah, I, I think there are... Oh yeah, um, so this is the question about how to handle it when some people are reluctant to complain despite many reasons to complain, not out of loyalty to an institution in an abstract sense, but to a cause or to a political party that matters. Uh, how, how do we motivate people to do the work of complaining without making them feel like they have to lose everything? Yeah. But, but, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I recognize that problem too, and just saying that matters, that we, as collectors of complaints, those of us who, for one reason or another, end up in those positions, that we recognize that the reluctance people have to complain comes from all sorts of different reasons, and part of that could be people's attachments to something that they perceive to be necessary to the project of crafting a better world. So there's a contradiction potentially between that vision of the future and the need to actually make a complaint about something that's compromising their capacities to exist in the present. And that that's a really, really difficult situation to be in. Um, I mean, I, I suppose my only way thing I would say is that I, in terms of institutional processes, I don't see attachment to a project as that different to attachment to an institution. Because it, one of the things I really learned from receiving complaints, and I have ended up receiving so many, because once you tell people that you're willing to receive them, you will receive them more and more. And I still receive them, and it's, I consider it a privilege, but um, that many people felt that the people that weren't supporting them when they tried to complain with the people with whom they had a political allegiance, that those were the people that would often say, no, shh, shh, keep it quiet, keep it quiet. And they would do so out of defense of a project, like a feminist project, 
but that defense of a project came with defense of a person, perhaps the person who was harassing someone. It became the defense of an institution because the project and the institution were so hard to separate. So the kind of the, the conservatism that if you end up with is often not a result of any sort of super identification with the institution or institutional loyalty. It's often because people see that their projects can't be disentangled from the institutions, the future of their party, the future of the project requires that the complaint be kept secret. And my only, I mean, I, I have a sort of commitment for a reason. I'm willing to snap a bond that's damaging to others. And so I suppose, I suppose what we have to do collectively is find a way where people can actually bring those kinds of complaints out um, safely, uh, because actually, as soon as you begin to not to to um, withhold a complaint or keep it behind closed doors in order to protect a project, you're you're actually reproducing the problem. So we have to find a way in which that that problem can be brought out in order to have um, those projects that are shared be there, be kept alive. I, I, I have had so many cases where people have said to me, like projects that they had held really, really dearly, you know, that, that, that in the end, those projects actually had a massive, massive violent effect on people because no one was willing to, to, to give them up. So I, I do think, I'm not really answering your question, it's kind of unanswerable, I think. I, I think we need a, a better way of talking about this, particularly if you're involved in uh, activist groups or NGOs or leftist groups, we have to find a way of prioritizing the need to talk to talk about forms of violence that are present that are undermining people's capacity to be in those spaces. That matters more than the project in a bigger sense, I think. just other people some and sometimes to be, to be involved in a project of killing joy is prepared to have your own joy killed and um that's some of the hardest stuff and and the, the actually the work of the plant has taught me that more than anything quite a few people have talked about how hard it was to actually recognize that they were being harassed because to actually recognize that they were being harassed would mean that they would have to give up something that was bringing them joy being on the PhD program that they loved, working with supervisors that they loved so that they didn't admit what was going on to and let it in would mean to no longer have that attachment. It's really, really hard to let some stuff in and if you have to prepare for your own joy to be killed, well, there's no problem. So, so I, do, I do, when I meet, I mean, I think killing joy is about killing joy. And I, it's not like a flight. I want to be flight about it. It's, it's actually, Chelsea also has a, a section on butt coat. You know, so I think she, of, of the right, she's one of the writers I admire the most because of her willingness to take on that kind of positive aspect of white Australian um, supremacy, which is very invested in positive aspect. And she's like, fuck, fuck, you know, and I love it. I think it's so, so brilliant because it's like, hope so often offered to you is some kind of like little promise in the future, which can just you from what's happening now, the violence that's present now, to really let that in. Is to do something really similar. so yeah. I mean, I I I suppose I've got this, this term killjoy joy, um, which is obviously I'm implying that killjoy is an adjective, so I'm implying this kind of joy attached to feeling joy. Um, and I don't, I I prefer the word joy to happiness, partly because with happiness has such a moral history. So I've got more joy in the potential joy than I do in the potential happiness. And I think. For me, killjoy joy is joy that stays close to the work of building more just world. So it's not joy that's about turning away 
and having that warm glow of beer party. Although we, we will need the warm glow of beer party. Like the relief when you get, you leave your, in my case, like the, the straightness of your family home and you get out to a queer club, you're like, oh, thank God. You know, that kind of sense of liberating from a tight shoe. You know, that, that, I, think that, I think that, yeah, it's clear joy. But it, it's never, it's precarious and it's not unrelated to the difficulties that lead you to find those spaces that's free. Um, and I think there's a bit of me that's like, yes, I understand and accept and embrace the turn to joy. But I also want to always be aware that actually joy can have, can lead to when playing the kind of occupation space that might be difficult for other people. And that, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm quite happy for the joy that I have to be always potentially um, challenged or negated by the, the need to listen to somebody whose version of reality or whose relationship to reality is different to mine. So I, I just don't see the best of like two different tracks. One thing that I really wanted to say in the handbook is like, it's not like there's like the sort of negative, destructive action can enjoy over the yeah, and then something very creative and like the positive story of empowerment over there. I, I wanted to see them as two parts of the same story. So even when we think about the blue sky, which was one of the most profound words of philosophy in the history of philosophy, in my view. Um, Claudia's act of, of uh, destroying the, the, the white baby doll, trying to see what stuff it's made from. Uh, it looks like a destructive act, but really what it is is about trying to work out or work through how some things put together. And in that action that appears to be destruction is creation. There is a way to think about the joy of imagining or acting in such a way that you're trying to, to bring something else about that could reflect you, that could give you room to be something. And um, so the killjoy joy, that's why like, I use killjoy joy, it's not just, it, it, maybe it can sound a little bit easy, but, it, but it's trying to say that sometimes the most joyful moments politically are when we're really, really close to that problem of the violence and who gets reproduced as an ideal. And it's that very mind work of working through and against that that we create for something else. Thank you. I just wanted to say uh, out loud what the question was about, drawing from Chelsea Ortega's work on Black Joy and asking Sara to elaborate on, on this process of killing joy and celebrating joy and the joy of killing joy. Uh, I'm going to find that you like a short question. On there, but I I to I I Well, I mean, I've yeah, like that for so many things. <laughs> they can definitely be amongst them. I mean, I think that the cool joy begins with the stereotype that that's what we're like, that the reason we object to harassment is because we're miserable and we want other people to be miserable. So rather like reclaiming queer, we, we don't agree that's that are all miserable and they want to be miserable, but we're willing to, to take the judgment and turn it around and turn it against those who are making the judgment. So there's always risk in such a project. Um, and I've been, even when you willingly claim the killjoy, still, so we position as a killjoy in a way that's really, really problematic. And we've got examples, there's a lot of examples of that in court. And, you know, there's a way in which, like, um, Queer joy, or, or just the fact that you're not unhappy to be queer, or you're happily queer, can be deeply threatening to the hetero patriarchal order. Because they, at one level, are invested in you being miserable because you haven't reached points that they presume are required for a happy and good life. Uh, maybe they think that now that we can get married, we're sort of happier, which, you know, <laughs> sorry, it's not my idea of, of queer happiness, personally, but that's, that's okay. Um, but, uh, so, so that, you know, you, 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 you're, you're still in a social situation where people are making judgments based on their idea about what life should be. 
and that that's true whether or not we claim the figure for Kildo. And I, but I should say I, I'm taking figure for Kildo. Obviously, I'm spending a lot of time on this. You know, I've had a blog. I wrote Thomas Happiness in 2010, and then Living Thomas Life. But then Miss Gilder had a bit more. For Thomas Happiness, she had like a, a chapter. And um, Living Thomas Life actually came with about four or five chapters, and then another got a whole handbook. And so I'm investing quite a lot, but that's not the only thing that I'm doing. There are like the, the Feminist Gilder is one way in to try and describe some of these complicated histories and kind of figures that we might claim in order to say no to who say no. Who says no to us? And there are many um, uh, that we could do that with. And we've done really interesting work on the angry black woman or the angry woman of color. Um, I was the, the figure of the melancholic migrant 